So this video is going to go through the key concepts in biology, paper one, specifically it's for AQA, it's for foundation students, so there's no higher only content, but if you're a higher student, hello, it will still be worth your time. Um, presumably if you're watching this, it's because I've told you to, so hello. If by some magical coincidence you found this somehow, Obviously, it's still welcome. Um, you might just find me a bit annoying, and that's fair enough. Most people do. So um, let's have a look. So in this video, we're going to go through the key topics. If you're watching it on YouTube, I'll put in the description the timings of which each of these points come up. So if there's something specific you're after, you can just go there and see when it is rather than having to watch the whole thing. So cell biology, here are the topics we're going to cover in this, and let's get straight to it with cells. You need to know how to draw an animal or plant cell. In an animal there are five parts you need to know and in a plant cell there are eight. We're going to start with an animal cell. So the first thing you do is you just draw a circle and to show that that space in the middle is an empty you could colour it in or shade it in and the third thing you do is you draw a black blob. So already you've drawn three of the five things. The cell membrane which controls what can enter or leave the cell the cytoplasm, which is the site of chemical reactions, and the nucleus, which controls the cell's activity and has the DNA in it. So the fourth thing are these. They are called mitochondria, and it's where aerobic respiration happens. We'll do more on that later in the video, but it's basically um, where energy is released. And the th uh, fifth thing, sorry, are these little black dots here, which are called ribosomes, and ribosomes make protein. So if you want, you could pause the video and see if you can answer the questions. I'll leave it for a sec, then I'll put the answers on the screen for you. So we've done animals, we now need to know plants. Thankfully, there are eight in there, but you already know five because it's the same ones that were in the animal cells. So it's pretty much the same at the start. For example, we draw an outline, but notice this one's a bit more square. That's the cell membrane. We shade it in, that's the cytoplasm. We draw the blob, that's the nucleus. We draw the mitochondria here, and we draw the little protein making dots called ribosomes. So the extra three then, let's go through them one by one. The first one is this, it's a cell wall. Just like the wall in your building, your room, wherever you are, provides structure and support. That's also true of the cell wall. This thing in the middle is called the vacuole, and it contains salt or salt however you want to say it and sugar and then lastly we have these things the chloroplast which is where photosynthesis happens and again more on that later in the vid so here are the three extra plant only parts and here's all the plants uh, all the parts even of the plant with the yellow bits signaling that they're just in plant cells and again pause it here if you're interested um, i'll put the answers on now so microscopes, you probably love maths and that's good news because in an exam they might say find out the magnification of an image or the actual size of something or the image size and they will give you two of those three. But the question is, well, how do I, what do I do to them to work out the missing third? And this triangle answers your questions. You'll see a lot of these in physics, but this one's easier because I am is like a little sentence, like I am watching a video. I am incredibly bored, so on and so forth. It's easier to remember. All you do is, if something is above or below each other, you divide it together. If they are next to each other, you multiply them, you times them together. So for example, if I'm looking for the image size, I cover up the I and I'm left with actual size times magnification. If I was looking for the actual size, then I would cover up the A and I would be left with image size divided by magnification. And if I, for example, was looking for magnification, I would cover it up and I'd be left with image size versus, ver uh, where I get verses from, image size divided by actual size, like so. But the fun doesn't stop because if you are calculating magnification, you need to make sure image size, which could be in millimetres, is in the same unit as actual size, which might be in micrometres. So here are three different units. Millimetre is the biggest, smaller than that is micrometres, and smaller than that is nanometres. 
So if you're going from a big to small unit, you multiply by 1000. For example, six millimeters, if I wanted to know what that was in micrometers, I would times it by 1000. And the same is true going from micrometers to nanometers. Going the other way, that is into something bigger, you do the opposite and you divide it by a thousand. So if you're going into something smaller, that's going down on our table, you times it by a thousand. If you're going into something bigger, that is going upwards on our table, you divide it by a thousand. So if you want to have a practice of that, pause now, have a go, and the answer's coming up in two seconds. Right, transport, let's try and get through this. So stuff moves around cells and you need to understand how, but all of that depends on this idea of concentration, which is bas basically a measure of how crowded the particles are. So the more crowded they are, the higher the concentration. Here are two beakers, let's just say it's water. There's the same volume, right? It's the same amount in both. However, one has a much lower concentration because there's not many particles in it. And the other has a much higher concentration because the particles look very crowded. Oh, well, I don't quite know what that, I don't know what's going on there, but there go the curtains. So diffusion is the movement of particles from a high to low concentration and it's passive, meaning it doesn't take energy. So let me show you what I mean. On my diagram, I've got a high concentration of green particles in the bottom left. That is, there's a lot of them and they're going to move because of diffusion to an area of a low concentration. That is where there's less of them. So the particles move around and you can see they become kind of spread out. So that's diffusion. The next one is osmosis. So this is the movement of water particles from an area of a high water concentration to an area of a low water concentration through a partially permeable membrane. So this is specifically to do with water and water is a very small molecule, unlike say sugar, which is quite big. And it's through a partially permeable membrane. Now a partially permeable membrane is a bit like a gate. So it might let someone or something small through like water but something larger like sugar or a tank wouldn't be able to get through. So let's have a look. There's our water, there's our sugar, and that dashed line is the partially permeable membrane. So here I've got a higher concentration of water on the left than the right. So because of osmosis, it's going to go from a high water concentration on the left to a low concentration of water on the right. And it's going to do that through the partially permeable membrane. So that's a high tech animation for you there. And you can see now it's once again evenly concentrated. It's been spread out and it didn't take any energy. Right, last one, active transport. So this is basically the opposite of diffusion. It's going from a low concentration where there's not a lot to a high concentration where there's already a lot. And that requires energy. That's why it's called active transport. So here's an example. I've got a root hair cell, so that's a cell of a plant in the soil. And you can see in the soil, there's a low concentration of mineral ions, those little purple dots. And in the plant, there's a high concentration of mineral ions. But the plant still wants those, you know, six or so mineral ions that are outside in the soil. So it will use active transport to take them from a low concentration, that is where there's not a lot, to a high concentration, that is where there's a lot of them. And that will require, oh, that will I've developed a star and a lisp there. Let me try that again. That will require energy. So if you want, you could pause the video, see if you could work out what's diffusion, what's os osmosis, and what's active transport. I'll give you a second to do that now if you want. And there they are. Right, so cell cycle and mitosis. So the cell cycle and mitosis are kind of the same thing we'll have a look right now so if you're going to grow or you're going to repair your body you're going to need more cells to do that and specifically you're going to make two new cells or rather as you can see in the little gif gif whatever it's called one cell is going to produce one more giving you a total of two so here's how it happens here's my normal cell and what's going to happen first of all in a part of the cell cycle is all the little structures are going to double there's going to be a spare version of them if you like 
So now, after that, we're going to look at something briefly in the nucleus, which is where the chromosomes are. So these little uh, lines I've got there, little blue and orange lines, represent a chromosome. And a chromosome is a store of DNA. Now, really, there wouldn't just be a couple. There'd be a lot. But for the sake of making it easier to understand, we're just going to show you two of them rather than, you know, 46 of them. So they're meant to be in the nucleus. And you can see I've drawn a dashed line around them, which shows that the nucleus breaks down. And then if you look on the right, I've just shown you a section of the cytoplasm. So the nucleus breaks down so that the chromosomes that are normally in there are actually now kind of loose in the cytoplasm. And at this point, once it, well, at this point, these loose uh, chromosomes, you can see double. So rather than looking like worms, they look a bit like X shapes. And at that stage, we're ready for mitosis. Now, in mitosis, these X shapes that we've got, these chromosomes, which have doubled, first thing they do is they line up, all right? So they line up in the middle. Once they're all neatly lined up, one half or one arm, if you like, of each X is pulled to a separate side of the cell, like so. And then once they're in the separate edges of the cell, a nucleus begins to form around each set once again. So let's zoom out. You'll see that it looks something like this. And now that one big cell, and I've not shown it that there would be mitochondria and ribosomes and things in the cytoplasm, it slowly begins to separate until I've got two daughter cells. So the cell cycle includes mitosis, and mitosis is just the part where the chromosomes begin to line up and get pulled apart, etc. That's a little tricky, and I might have butchered the explanation slightly, so if it's helpful, perhaps go back and watch it. If you want to have a go at a question, then you could pause this and see if you can answer it, put them in order, and I'll give you the answers in one second. And here are the answers. Right, so that's cell biology. Now we're going to do organisation. So there's the list of topics. The first one's very easy. It's just that a cell, a group of cells working together to perform the same function is a tissue. A group of tissues working together to perform the same function, the same job, are an organ. And a group of organs working together to produce for the same function, sorry, are a system. So a bunch of cells make a tissue, a bunch of tissues make an organ, a bunch of organs make a system. And if you like, all of the system, systems in a body make the whole organism. So that's sometimes a question just to put them in order of size. So cell is the smallest, system is the largest. Right, we're going to look at enzymes. So some key things just to know is that they are proteins. They're not alive and they're catalysts, which means they speed up a reaction. So let's try and talk through this in a sensible way. If you have a look, you can see we've got the green thing. The whole green kind of Pac-Man looking thing is the enzyme. The orange bit that makes up the mouth of the Pac-Man is called an active site. And these bluey things on the right are called substrates. And a substrate is anything that can bind with an enzyme. But if you have a look at these, which of those three is going to bind with the active site? Is it that top one? Well, probably not because the shape of it's a little wrong. It's not that middle one either. But that bottom substrate does look like it could fit in the active site of the enzyme. So what happens is this. The enzyme, which is all of that green area, has a special region, a special space called an active site, which is shown by the orange bit. And within that active site, a substrate, that's anything that might get broken down, can fit perfectly into it, like so. And once it's in that active site, the enzyme might break it down and cut it up into a couple of different products. So substrate will bind to the active site of the enzyme and it can get broken down or it can actually um, build things up. Each enzyme is specific to each substrate and they call that the lock and key model. So just like how the keys on my key ring can't open my next door neighbor's gate or their front door or whatever, a substrate can't go in any old enzyme. They have to be specific. And we saw that if I just pop back with these different shapes here. Only one of them 
can fit into that active site. So we call that a lock and key model because it's like the substrate represents the key and the enzyme represents the lock. If they were different shapes, they wouldn't work, as we're going to see, because enzymes can denature, and that's when the active site changes shape. So here on the left, the substrate and the active site, they're the same, call it complementary, they're the same shape, so it works, it's fine. However, here on the right, you can see the active site now is a funny shape, it's changed shape, and that substrate no longer fits neatly in. So that enzyme on the right has denatured. And there are different things that can make an enzyme denature. For example, you can't really tell with that font, but that P is a lowercase and the H is a capital. A PH can interfere with the bonds of the active site, so it might make it change shape. Or a temperature, if it's too high, can interfere with the bonds of an, act of an active site and make it change shape. So if conditions aren't good, the enzyme can denature. But if the conditions are perfect, then you have what's called an optimum. So just like how you might prefer to work in a quiet room or a hot room or a cold room or whatever, enzymes are the same. There are certain conditions upon which they work best. And those conditions, whether it's temperature or pH, are called optimum pH or optimum temperature. So you might be given a graph and you have to spot the optimum. Now it's just going to be where the activity is the highest, so it's going to be the peak of the graph. But let's just talk through this for a second, so you can see temperature along the bottom and the rate of um, photosynthesis, which depends on enzymes, going vertically. So at the start, when the temperature is low, the enzymes don't have a lot of energy, so the rate of photosynthesis is quite low. But here, it's got its optimum amount. You can see the temperature at that, at that much temperature the rate of photosynthesis couldn't be any higher, it's at its maximum it can be. But then even though the temperature keeps going, the rate of photosynthesis suddenly drops down. And that's because it's got too hot. If you remember what we said about denaturing, the active site has changed shape because of that temperature, and so it's unable to accept the substrates in. So again, pause if you want, I'll give you two seconds. Right. So, what's in blood? So, there are four different things in blood, and you can call them components, which makes it sound fancy, but it's not really. So, the first one are red blood cells, and red blood cells are kind of like delivery cells. So, just like this bloke here is carrying some oxygen to a cell, that's what the red blood cells do. They might, in return, take some carbon dioxide back with them. So, that's red blood cells for you. Let's have a look at white blood cells. We'll do a bit more on white blood cells in um, another topic later on. But white blood cells are kind of like the soldiers of your blood. Their job is to find and destroy any um, anything that shouldn't be there. So any microorganisms, say, that shouldn't be there. After that, you have platelets. And platelets are kind of like plasters. So if you cut yourself, get a little paper cut, you don't just bleed to death. You don't say, you know, I've had a great life, but my time is up. God bless, I'm out. Instead, your body will stop yourself from bleeding. And it does that because platelets will gather up at the cut and they will what's, um, what's called clot. So a blood clot to stop you bleeding and to stop infectious things getting in. That's the job of platelets. Now, the fourth and final component is called plasma. If you think about it, red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets are all solids, but yet your blood is a liquid. So plasma is the liquid in which everything is carried. And within that liquid, other things can dissolve. So you can kind of think of it like the lorry that carries it all around, helps it be transported and helps it flow. So have a look if you're interested, pause this, see if you can fill it in. I'll give you a couple of seconds. Right, so that's blood. But what does blood travel in? It's not just loose in your body. It travels in something called blood vessels. And here's a picture of some of them. They could be an artery, could be a vein, or it could be a capillary. And you need to know what each one is and how it's structured to do its job. So let's have a look. Let's start with arteries. Now, the job of an artery is to take blood away from the heart. So I remember that because of the artery A away A. Is taking it away from the heart 
and because it's taking it away from the heart it's under a lot of pressure because the heart has to pump that blood out with enough pressure that it can go all the way to the tip of your toes and all the way back to your heart so therefore blood in arteries is under high pressure as it goes away from the heart so how does it cope with the high pressure well first of all it's got thick walls and second of all it's got elastic and muscular fibers meaning it can stretch and it can withstand the high pressure if it didn't do that then it would burst and you'd be in trouble but thankfully it's got thick walls and it's elastic and it's muscular now let's have a look at a vein a vein looks something like this and a vein's job is to bring the uh, blood in your body back towards your heart so arteries go away but veins go towards i sometimes think towards vein tv towards t vein v tv um, and therefore it's under less pressure now so its walls don't need to be quite so thick and you'll notice that it's got those little pink things sticking out and they're valves and the job of the valve is to make sure the blood can only go in one direction it's kind of like a turnstile right? like a football stadium or something or a train station once you've gone through you can't necessarily get back so it makes sure the blood can only go one way so high pressure you have the arteries and low pressure you have the veins it makes sense that the high pressure one would have thick walls just like how a fireman's hose is this big canvas material because it's under high pressure where the hose in your garden or something is a very thin rubber because it's under lower pressure right the last one is a capillary and you can see that its cell wall is tiny right so that the wall that makes up the capillary is just a single cell thick the point of this is that it's able to allow things to diffuse out or in really easily so the oxygen say that's inside of the capillary in the red blood cell can diffuse out of it very quickly rather than having to go through a massive thick wall to get to where it needs to be the other benefit of capillaries is they're really small so the way i think about this is that if the capillary's got to get really close to a cell it can't do that if it's massive for example if i drive to work i'm mainly on big motorways but a motorway can't take me right up to the door of the school and it can't take me right up to my front door in order to get there i have to go on smaller road smaller roads that might just be one lane for example and and that's kind of what a capillary does it lets the blood get closer to the parts of the body the cells and when it's there it's got a small wall so it can diffuse in and out easily so i think it's time for a question if you want pause it now i'll give you a second as always might have a quick cough while no one's listening <coughs> i've been dying for that um and here's your answers i'll give you a second pause it again if you're watching still right over halfway infection and response so there uh what happened there voice crack we'll move past it probably no one watching communicable or i've been getting some you know getting some heat for this i say communicable but i think it's probably pronounced Communic no hold on what do i say communicable commun i don't know I, I don't know how it's said is the is the long story short i'm saying communicable here they are so what are these diseases they're anything that's caused by a pathogen and a pathogen is anything that a microorganism that can cause a disease so a communicable disease is one that can be spread and in order for it to be spread you must be spread in something there must be something that you can catch and the thing that you can catch is a pathogen for example i can't spread cancer to you or a heart attack but i could spread the flu because i can pass a virus to you so there are two diseases you need to know that are caused by bacteria there's salmonella which can be cooked through uncooked or unclean food you'll vomit you'll have diarrhea and there's gonorrhea which is a sexually transmitted disease where you'll have yellow or green genital discharge and pain when urinating these three are caused by viruses there's hiv this is spread through bodily fluids it will cause flu-like illness and it destroys your white blood cells so it leaves you very vulnerable tmv you can see affects plants it gives a mosaic like a dotted pattern on the leaf so those areas can't do photosynthesis so they can't produce as much energy and they tend to be smaller and the third one there is measles you'll get a red skin rash it can spread through sneezes but there are vaccines available which we'll talk about in a sec so there's your three viruses 
almost there. So there's one disease you need to know that's caused by a fungi or a fungus. It's called uh, it's called rose black spot. This may surprise you, but it infects plants like roses and they get black spots. And then lastly, malaria, which is caused by a protist pathogen. And the life cycle of malaria involves a mosquito. So the mosquito, they call it the vector of the disease. It can pass it around. If you have malaria, you'll have a fever and it can be fatal. So again, pause if you want to try and match these up. Give you a sec. And there's your answers there. So there's a bunch of things that are trying to kill you. Generally, we don't want that to happen. So the first thing is you have some physical defences. So they're not specific. That is, they'll just stop anything. It's not like they only work on viruses or only work on fungi. And here they are. The first one is skin. Obviously, you have skin, so that's a barrier to stop things getting in your body. You have hairs. They might look a bit ugly, and as you get a bit older, they might get longer and longer. Maybe you've recently invested in a nose trimmer. Maybe you've not. Who can say? Where was I going with that? Oh, yeah, hairs in your nose. So... Basically, you know, there's things in the air, pathogens in the air, and those little hairs in your nose can stop you inhaling them. If you do breathe something in, then your airways are lined with special cells called, a, called cilia cells, which have little hairs on them, and there's mucus on top. So it's like a sticky pathway where pathogens might get stuck, and then these little cilia cells, like a Mexican wave motion, will um, let you cough them out for example and the fourth thing is stomach acid so there is a point of that acid and that it's in, it can destroy pathogens so if you eat food that's maybe a bit dodgy there's a chance it will get destroyed in your stomach before it passes in your body so there are some physical defenses but they're not perfect and things still get through and that's where your white blood cells are important so we said earlier that they're kind of like soldiers they hunt out and they destroy pathogens or microorganisms and you need to know how they do that and they do that in three ways it can engulf it can release antibodies and it can release antitoxins and we'll do a quick bit on those three now here's a is it gif or gif who who knows i think technically it's actually gif no was it gif i don't know i might cut that out of the video i might not anyway so the white blood cell engulfs a path pathogen and all that means is it surrounds it you can see that happening and once it finally catches and surrounds it, it will use enzymes to destroy it. So that's one thing that your white blood cells can do. They can engulf pathogen or pathogens, as you can see on the screen. The other thing they can do is release antibodies. And an antibody looks like a Y, like you can see on the title, like someone doing the YMCA. It's a special protein that's released, secreted by the white blood cells, that can help to destroy pathogens. So here, for example, is the antibody. The thing looks like a Y. And there's my pathogen. So white blood cell might release these antibodies. So the three are, there's engulf, which we've spoke about. There's antibodies, which we spoke about. And the last one are antitoxins. So it might be that, for example, a bacteria releases toxins in your body that makes you feel ill. And your white blood cells can release antitoxins, like the name suggests. They're against toxins and they neutralize the toxins. So the bacteria might still be there, but it's harmful effects. You won't be feeling them anymore. Again, pause it if you want. It's just ticking some boxes. Hopefully you got them right. Vaccines. Okay, here we go then. So a vaccine is an injection that makes you immune from a disease. So you need to know how it works, basically. So let's go through it. The first thing is this. You're going to get a dead or weakened form of the pathogen that you that you want to be protected against injected into you. So what happens is this, your white blood cell, it recognises that pathogen, it knows it shouldn't be there, and it releases a bunch of antibodies. And even though it wasn't going to do any harm, it still destroys it. So it's kind of like a sparring match. You get this weaker version and you practice fighting it off. Now it might be that some months or weeks or years later, you're on the train or the bus or whatever at work, at school, and you come across the pathogen for real this time. Now, what happens is your white blood cells, they recognise it because they've seen it before, and they release more antibodies a lot faster. So the pathogen doesn't even have a chance to harm you. And at that point, you're said to be immune. 
you can catch the pathogen but not have the symptoms. So let's have a look here. So along the bottom, going left to right, is days in time, going up in tens from zero to 90, and going vertically, bottom to top, you can just about read. It says concentration of antibodies in blood plasma. So at the start, when you have the vaccine, it's a slow release of antibodies. It takes about, you know, 30 days really for them to come and go. And even then you don't have that many. But the second time, just after 60 days, when you get the infection for real, you can see it releases a lot more antibodies and it does it a lot faster. So that's how you become immune. If you want, put these in order. There's a couple of clues on the slide. I'll put the answers up in a click. And there's the answers for you, Paul, if you're interested. Right, almost there, people. Bioenergetics. There's just two little things. Photosynthesis, respiration. So, photosynthesis. Here's a plant cell. There are the three parts that are in a plant cell and not an animal cell. And we are interested in a chloroplast because that is where photosynthesis happens. Now, in photosynthesis, you take water and carbon dioxide and it's converted into oxygen and glucose. So that is the word equation for it because we're using words, not symbols. Just note that we've used a plus sign and we've used an arrow to show it being converted and a non-equal sign. So you might be asked to do a balanced symbol equation. So along the bottom, I've got all of the symbols for each of the four parts. Let's think. So water is H2O, carbon dioxide is CO2, oxygen is O2 and glucose, a bit trickier, C6H12O6. So that's a symbol equation, but it isn't balanced by what, well, what do I mean by that? For example, I can see that there are 12 H's on the right hand side of the arrow, but there's only two on the left hand side. So all you have to do to balance it, and this is very simple, is you just put a six in front of those three. So six H2O, six CO2, produce 6O2 and glucose C6H12O6. So there it is for you. So the water you're going to get from the soil, the carbon dioxide you get from the air, that arrow represents light energy, so you get from the sun. The oxygen is actually generally wasteful. You, you make as a plant more than you need. So for example, the oxygen will leave the leaf and it does that through stomata. And stomata are little tiny holes in the plant, often in the bottom of the leaf, and they're controlled by something called guard cells. So guard cells can open or close the stomata. So in my diagram here, the stomata is that black part, and the guard cell is the green part that surrounds it. So that's how oxygen leaves the plant. And then you have glucose, which you can use for energy, as we're about to see, and in a plant, lots of other things also. So pause if you want, see if you can fit in the question marks. There you go. Right, respiration is the last bit. You need energy for lots of things. You need it for active transport, you need it to build molecules, and you need it to keep warm. So where does the energy come from? Well, it comes from a process called aerobic respiration. So respiration is just a chemical process that releases energy, and aerobic means air. So put that together, an aerobic respiration is a chemical process that uses oxygen, that's the aerobic part, to release energy. That's the respiration part. So it's a chemical reaction that uses oxygen to release energy. Now, if you remember earlier, right at the start, I said we'll do more about aerobic respiration when I mentioned the mitochondria, because this process happens inside the mitochondria. So this is the word and balance symbol equation. And if you're looking at that thinking it, that looks kind of familiar, it's because it's just the reverse of photosynthesis. So photosynthesis was carbon dioxide and water makes glucose and oxygen and aerobic respiration is the opposite. So it's like a buy one, get one free offer. Just learn one and then flip it around if you need to. Now, this looks exactly the same, but look carefully and you'll see it says anaerobic respiration, not aerobic respiration. So aerobic respiration uses oxygen, but anaerobic respiration does not. So this will happen when there is not enough or no oxygen. So it still releases energy, 
but less, about 5% as much, uh, um, about 5% of the energy that aerobic respiration releases. So it could be the case that you're doing really intense exercise and you can't get enough oxygen in, you can't breathe um, fast enough to get all the oxygen you need, so your body does anaerobic respiration. So you don't need to know any balance symbol equations, you just need to know the word equation. So this is a chemical reaction, and as the cytoplasm is the site of chemical reactions, in an animal, for example, it will happen in the cytoplasm. So, all right, let's have a look at this word equation. In animals, all bacteria cells, it's really easy, it's just glucose straight into lactic acid, and in the process it will release some energy. In plants and yeast cells, it's glucose converted into carbon dioxide and ethanol, which you might also know as alcohol. So that's actually kind of useful, and let's look at why. Because the ethanol that's produced can be used to make beer or wine, and the carbon dioxide that's produced is often used in baking to help make the bread rise. That's why you might use yeast, for example, in baking, or you can use hops and yeast and things in making alcohol. So if you're wanting to, if you're interested, pause it, see if you can fill in the gaps here. And then here's a nice summary of all those word equations. So that's the last slide. I think that was about 40 minutes, not too bad, hopefully. Just to recap everything, that's not, you know, the entirety of paper one or the video would have to be six hours long. But I've had a decent go explaining the main bits. I hope it's sort of been useful. Um, if it's not, then you have wasted 37 minutes of your life that you can never get back. But then, you know, on the plus side, so have I. Um, so we're evens. See you later.